عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد Respected listeners, <coughs> on one occasion, a man came to Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, and he came to him and he was complaining about his son, about the bad manners or other complaints that he had about his son. Umar he became very upset on how the father was upset of the behavior of his son. So Umar he called this young boy in to question him and to ask him what is the matter. The boy entered and sat next to the father. And when Umar he saw the father started to behave a little bit differently when his father when his son sat next to him Umar he asked the young boy what is the matter why is your father so upset with you and why is he complaining about you the boy he turned to Umar and he said ya amir al mu'minin don't judge me listen and then you can make your judgment the young boy he said to Umar al khattab just as the child the parents have rights towards the child how the child should behave towards the parents likewise the child also has rights on how the parent should treat the children as well and Umar he responded he said yes so the young man he asked Umar he said so what is the right of my father upon me and Umar al-Khattab responded he said number one is that your father he chooses a righteous woman to marry and that is your mother number two he said this is that you are given a good name And number three, your third right from your parents is that your father, he teaches you the Holy Quran. This young boy, he turned to Umar and he said, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, my father has done none of the three that you have mentioned above. As for my mother, she was an ex-slave who he bought and she had some problems, she had some illnesses. And he bought her and he stayed with her for a few days and she, you know, gave birth. And when she gave birth, she was displeased with the fact that I was her child. Furthermore, when it comes to the name, he named me Ju'la, which in Arabic it means a, a, an insect that is found in the desert. He said, he didn't even give me a good name. And in terms of the Holy Quran, he never taught me a single ayah. 
Umar Khattab, he picked up his stick. And you know, Umar would teach people a lesson with his stick. He picked up his stick and he said to the father, he said to him, you are the one who has done the taqseer. You are the one who has done the shortcomings before your son. So he told him to get out and sort himself out. Brothers and sisters, the reason I make mention of this story is the fact that not just that the parents have rights, but also the children have rights and the parents have to fulfill the children's rights. And in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Al-Malu wal Banun Zinatul Hayat dunya that wealth and your children they are the adornment, the beauty of this dunya. Wal baqiyatu salihatu khairun inda rabbika thawaban wa khairun amala. That everything else is righteous and good. The two things Allah makes mention of in this ayah is Al Mal and in the mention of Al Banun. Both of these two things, if you do well in them, in the upbringing of your children, in your earning of halal income, your spending of good money, your time that you spent with your children, you will have success in most cases, not just in this world, but you'll also have success in the hereafter. Likewise, on the exact opposite side, if you earn your money in a haram way, you spend your money in a haram way, you do not focus on your children, you do not give them their rights, you do not give them the tarbiyah that they deserve, then you will have problems, not just in this world, but you'll have even bigger problems in the next world. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مُسْؤُولْ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ That every one of you is a shepherd, and you are responsible for your heart. Imam ibn al-Qayyim, rahmullah, he mentions a story on the same topic. He mentions that there was a mother and a father, they were sitting in front of a qadi. And they were debating and disputing who is going to take custody of the child. The father wanted the child, the mother wanted the child. So then the Qadi, he looked at the boy and the boy was mature. He was sensible in age. So he said, you decide, where would you like to go? Would you like to go with your mother or with your father? The boy responded and he said, I would like to live with my father. So the judge said he can go with the father. So he packed his bags and they were ready to go. The mother then stopped the Qadi and she said to the judge, can you just ask him why he made that decision? And at that point that the boy, he said, if I live with my mother, my mother will make me go to madrasa. She will make me memorize Quran. And then the teacher may hit me. But if I go with my father, he will let me play. He will let me wander in the streets and I can come back whenever I want to come back. The Qadi did a U-turn and he said to the mother, you take the child and you bring up the child. Why? Because the children have rights. The tarbiyah of children, they have rights. And the tarbiyah of our children, brothers and sisters, is an amana. It is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O people who believe, save yourselves and your families from the fire. And when we look through the Quran, we find that even the anbiya, the anbiya, the most righteous people, they made dua and they would always be concerned about their own children. Ibrahim alayhi salam, what did he say? Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as salat wa min dhurriyati, rabbana wa taqabbil dua. He would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept his prayers and he would also make dua for his dhurriya, for his children. Likewise we find, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَانَ يَقْرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّي مَرْضِيَّةِ That even Ismail alayhi salam, his father was righteous and was concerned about his children. Ismail alayhi salam was righteous and concerned about his children. And he would teach them the prayer and he would teach them the zakat and he was good to them. Likewise, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs us in the Quran, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Inform your children to pray and be persistent upon that. لَا نَسْأَلُكَ الرِّزْقَ We do not ask you of any wealth or anything in return. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives you rizq. وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ So even through the Prophets, we see that their primary concern was the upbringing of their children. Now I want to just bring forward to you and highlight to you some of the problems that we have in our own communities and in our, in our own societies when it comes to our youngsters, our teenagers, and those who are young adults. That we are 4% or just over 4% of the population in this country. In a recent uh, article by BCVN, we find that in this article it tells us that the Muslims that are found in UK prisons, their population has doubled to 12,000 in just a decade. That the record levels of Muslims found in jail sentences, that from 8%, just a decade later, we are now 14% of the prison populations in England. And we are 4% of just the population itself. Not just that, if you thought that was scary enough, brothers and sisters, in London alone, London prisons, we're talking about Belmarsh, we're talking about Scrubs, we're talking about uh, uh, Brixton, other prisons. We are on average 27% of the population of the prisons in London alone when we are only 4% of the population. 
How do you expect the community to grow and to rise and to become successful when their youth are going into prisons at this, at this rate? Not just that, brothers and sisters, but even if you look academically, you can see the results, GCSE results, A-level results. You can go to gov.com and you can check results by ethnicity, by, re by religion, and you will see on that that unfortunately, that you find that the Muslims are in the lower percentile, they're in the last third of achievers. This is alone on the GCSEs. How are we going to grow if we don't sort our own children out, if we don't invest in the future? Wallahi, the future, it belongs to those who invest in it today. And we know that we have to work. We have to work with our children, we have to work with our youngsters, we have to work as a community, not as individuals. I can bring up my child successfully, but that is not the way. The way to think as a community at home, how can we progress? How can we move forward? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Al-Islam ya'lu wa la yu'la alayhi. That Islam is always to be at the top, it is never to be second or third place. But at the moment, where do we find ourselves? It means we've got work to do. Brothers and sisters, one of the steps that we can take in order for us to aid and to assist our youngsters in becoming successful. Number one, let's start with the Anbiya they started. What did they do? They made dua for their children. When is the last time you raised your hands up and you asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect your children, to make dua for their future, for dua for their iman, dua for their akhirah, dua for them in success in the dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells that even Ibrahim alayhi salam, what did he say? Rabbi habli min as-salihin. That even before having a child, he used to make a dua to Allah, Allah bless me with a child, but not just any child. He didn't just ask for children, but he said, min as-salihin. Make my child righteous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded, فَبَشَرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ And we blessed him with a righteous child. Even when you look at Zakaria alayhi salam, when he would make dua, he's an old man who didn't have children, and he wanted children. What did he used to say? Was Zakaria is nada rabbahu rabbi la tadni fardan wa anta khairu alwarithin. Fastajabna lahu wa wahabna lahu yahya wa aslahna lahu zawja. That he used to make dua to Allah. Oh Allah, bless me with a righteous child. Fastajabna lahu. Allah swt responded and gave him a child, and his child was righteous. And not just that he was righteous, but Allah subhanahu wa taala gave him his name. His name was Yahya. Likewise, we find Zakaria. Yarithuni wa yarithu bin Ali Yaqub wa ja'alhu Rabbi Radiyya. Even he would make, Zakaria would make dua. Give me a son, give me a child that will inherit my work, that will do righteousness because he was a prophet. So they didn't just want children, but they wanted good, righteous children who would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when we look at Maryam alayha salam, her mother when she was pregnant and she was holding Maryam, عليها السلام أن شكيف بها فتقبلها ربها بقبول حسن فأنبتها نباتا حسنا وكفالها زكريا الله سبحانه وتعالى he makes mention of مريم عليها السلام that not just that she was born as an unta but on top of that Allah he says وأنبتها نباتا حسنا that her terbiya was the best terbiya that she had that's why she is praised because of her upbringing and of her character so we see the importance of that inside of the Holy Quran. Brothers and sisters, so point number one is to make dua that our children are successful even before they enter into this world and while they're in this world. There is a very common dua that we read as well in the Quran. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنَ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا in this ayah, what, the, what is the dua that is being made? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hablana, Allah grant us min azwajina, from our wives or our spouse, wa dhurriyatina and our children, qurrata a'yun. Oh Allah bless us that when we see our spouses, that when we see our children, we see the pleasure of our eyes. We see the coolness of our eyes. And what could be more cooling to a parent's eye or a father's eye that he sees his son or his daughter when he comes home reading Quran, praying, making a car, doing righteousness in the house. Likewise, the husband when he comes home and he sees his wife doing good deeds, it makes him so happy. Likewise, the wife when she sees her husband going to the masjid or praying or doing stuff, it's the coolness to her eyes. She knows she made the right decision and she is happy. This is the dua that we make. Oh Allah, make our children Make our spouses the coolness of our eyes. But the question here is, to be the coolness of your father's eyes, or your husband's eyes, or your wife's eyes, is just not like that. It requires effort. If you want your children to be the coolness of your eyes, you have to dedicate time, money, and effort to make them the coolness of your eyes. No one is just born like that. So the question is, do we invest in our children? Do we spend time with our children? Do we invest money in our children? And then we, if we do, then we truly will understand the importance of this uh, ayah. 
Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he says that there are three du'as that are always answered. And from amongst those du'as, da'watul walid li waladihi. So when a father or a parent makes du'a for their children, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he tells that that du'a is always accepted. And likewise, when you do make du'a, don't just make du'a for your own children, but also make du'a for other people's children who are maybe struggling or maybe suffering. Make du'a for them. You know why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ مُسْلِمٍ يَدْعُ لِأَخِهِ بِظَهْرِ الْغِيبِ إِلَّا قَالَ أَلْمَلْكُ وَلَكَ بِمِثْلِهِ That there is, whenever you make a du'a for somebody else, there is an angel listening to that du'a, and the angel responds and says, Oh Allah, and give this person the same. So if you make du'a for your nieces and your nephews, that du'a is going to come back to you as well. If you make du'a for your brothers and sisters in the masjid, then that du'a is going to come back to you as well. So make prayers not just for yourself, but also make du'a for other people around you as well. Step number two. So we mentioned du'a. Hopefully you're memorizing these points. Number one is du'a. Number two. The next step in the tarbiyah of our children, very, very important, is that we are role models. The parents are role models. So if you want your children to be good, you yourself, you need to focus on yourself. You need to make sure that you are a good, righteous person. You know, in a hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, uh, he said, اِجْعَلُوا فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ مِنْ صَلَاتِكُمْ That make your nafil prayers and your sunnah prayers at home. What is one of the hikmah of that? Yes, our fara'id, we, as men, we try to come to the masjid and pray in congregation. But the nawafil prayers, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is prayed them at home. What is one of the hikmah of that? It is the fact that when you're praying at home, your children are watching you. Your wife is watching you. You don't need to tell them to pray. How many times have you prayed and your young daughter or son has pulled the musalla and started praying next to you? And you never told them to pray. Whereas if you tell them to pray, most likely they're not going to listen. But if you're doing it yourself, you'll find it automatically will come in line and will start to pray with you. If they find you, you never lie and you speak the truth, you'll find automatically your child will also be like that. If you are honest, you'll find your children will also be honest. So you are the number one role model and you have to live that life that you want your children to be. Especially, brothers and sisters, especially when it comes to the akhlaq, your mannerisms. How can you expect your children not to lie when you're lying? How can you expect your children to earn, earn halal when you're not earning halal? So your character and your akhlaq is very important. If you tell the children not to swear, but when you get angry, you're the first one to swear. How are they going to take your message seriously? You need to look in the mirror and you need to focus on yourselves. And I would add at this point as well, husband and wives, that if you ever have disagreements and you have conflict, never have that conflict in front of your children. Wait till the children are asleep, wait till they're away and address whatever problem you have with each other. Because whatever you will say to each other in front of the child, the child will absorb it and it will remain in their head for life. If you said something negative about your wife, that's his mother. He will remember that for life. So don't, don't argue and dispute in front of your children. If you have a discussion, do it behind closed doors. Number three, step number three. The tarbiyah of our children, brothers and sisters. We have to teach our children al-tarbiyah al-imaniyah, and that is the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very important that we teach our children from amongst the, fa- fa- uh, the matters of belief is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have to make them scholars. If you do, that's great. But the fact that they are aware that Allah is their Lord, that they're aware that Allah is watching, they're aware that Allah is listening, they're aware that there is a paradise waiting, they're aware that there is a hellfire waiting, and they're aware that they're going to enter into the grave. These basic things you need to put and instill in your child. Because there will come a time when your children will go to school, will go to university, will go to work, and you will not be there to protect them or to look after them. But if you've put the fear and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in them, you know you're safe. You know my child is not going to do this, most likely. He's not going to do this or he's not going to do that. Because Allah will come to their mind. And it's your duty to put that inside of them. Number four, the fourth point in which we can aid and assist uh, our children. Brothers and sisters, many, many schools are uh, the last day today for the, for the summer break. And you've got six weeks ahead. So I ask all of you, and answer it inside of your minds. I ask, ask all of you, for the next six weeks, what have you planned for your children? What Quranic program have you planned for them? What tarbiyah program have you planned for them? What educational program have you planned for them? And in many cases, most of us haven't got an answer for that question. Six weeks, what are they going to do? Run around and cause chaos? What have you planned for them for the next six weeks and how are you going to better them? They were not going to be in school. So you have an excellent opportunity to invest in your children. Some of schools are coming up older. What have you planned? Not just that, but even the Prophet ﷺ, he said, that not just that, but teach your children, male and female, teach them uh, archery, teach them swimming, and teach them horse riding. What does that mean? 
the Prophet ﷺ is teaching is that make your children strong. Make your children physically strong so they're aware and prepared for the challenges of life. Most of our children, forgive me for saying, but most of our children, they are raised up on chicken burger and chips. What do you expect? What do you, how strong of a character, how strong of a body is a person going to have? The Prophet ﷺ is saying, make your children strong, don't make them weak. A little bit of rain comes and they start sneezing, running indoors. We have to make our children strong in all aspects, physically strong, educationally strong, financially strong. This is how the Ummah will move forward and will develop. So the question is, what have you prepared for the next six weeks? My final point before I sit down, and this requires a whole new khutbah, but I want to just plant the seed in your minds. That is another point of tarbiya of our children, is that we select or we help in selecting a righteous spouse for our daughters and our sons. How many a sad stories have we seen where parents are not involved with the lives of the children and they may pick the spouse and they may destroy their lives because they were too hasty or they fell in love or something happened. You're the father, you're the mother, you have experience with life, you know what is good and what is bad. You need to aid and be part of your child's life, be a friend to them. And that big decision, you need to work with them on that decision because Wallahi Azim, if you make the wrong decision, that is going to be with you for life. If you make the right decision, you will have a very good life. So we have to aid our children and part of their tarbiyah is that we help them in finding good spouses. That requires a whole new khutbah. We will discuss that inshallah ta'ala in another time. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa alaikum sallam muslim inna wa rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> we are responsible as the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi we are responsible for the growth and the spread of Islam. We are responsible for the spread of khayr, al-amr bil ma'roof. And we are responsible for an nahil al-munkar, to stop evil spreading in society. And one of the ways in which this Ummah grows, and this Ummah will develop, and we as a community will grow, is by investing in your children. Wallahi, I say this boldly. If we don't invest in our children, we don't educate our children, we don't train our children, we are doing a disservice to Islam because they will not be prepared for the next journey. In order for, uh, for Islam to rise to the next level, you need to invest in your children today. And that is how important it is, otherwise it will be neglect. When it comes to tarbiyah, ask yourself how many hours you spend in the tarbiyah of your children. Your children are constantly under tarbiyah by other people. 8 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock they're at school. What are they learning? Inshallah, they're learning good, but they're also learning many other things. They're getting tarbiyah. When they're on their phones, and they're on there for hours on end, they're getting tarbiyah. They're getting trained. When they're sending text messages under the table, they think you can't see. Who are they sending text messages to? When they're taking a selfie and they think, but dad can't see, but you can see. Who are they sending those pictures to? They're also under tarbiyah. And they're also being influenced by other factors. As fathers and mothers, we see it, but we turn a blind eye. How many hours do we spend? Half an hour? 20 minutes? When the rest of the day they've been indoctrinated all day and night with different ideas. We need to be serious and we need to help in gaining the tarbiyah of our children. Brothers, this is the ayah that I read to you. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَةً قُرَةَ أَعْيُونَ The latter part of the ayah is also very important. Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا O oh Allah, make us leaders of the righteous people. Now you must think to yourself, what's the connection with the first part of the ayah and the second part of the ayah? Leadership and then tarbiyah. What is the, what's the connection? The connection is this. If you give good tarbiyah to your children, if you raise them up well, they're ready to become what? Righteous good leaders. They're, right, they're ready to take positions and roles in society where they can take this ummah forward. And we need good leaders in the mosques, in the workplace, in schools. We need to have Muslims who are leaders who can speak who can defend their deen, who can defend the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Leaders that can speak about the oppressed. Leaders that can address the challenges that we're going through. Leaders that can talk with confidence about the genocide that is taking place in Gaza. The genocide that is taking place in Sudan. That people are able to be brave and educated enough to speak and they're not fearful. Brothers and sisters, you know there was a, 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 a recent medical journal by the name of Lancet. did uh, did an investigation or research on the more accurate number of people that have been killed in Gaza. And the numbers that they've come to say that the death toll in Gaza is over 180,000 people. And that has not stopped. That is, while I'm speaking, it is ongoing. That is 10% of the whole population. 10% of, in nine months, a whole population, 10% has just been wiped out. And it's still been wiped out. 
which of our leaders in the world has spoken about this or is going to speak about it? Which one has the, has the, is brave enough to say something or do something? Nothing. No one. And the reality of the matter is, we have no hope in them speaking. So we have to turn to ourselves, grassroots. We have to produce leaders amongst ourselves. We have to produce people that are going to be able to talk and stand and speak and be brave. We have to do it. Because if they're not going to do it, we have no hope. We need to train our youngsters to be able to speak and to be able to be strong. Not just that, but the killing that is taking place in Sudan. Likewise, as I said, even we see in uh, uh, places like Pakistan, where we see a man who has been put into prison with no charges against him. How, how Islamic is that for an Islamic uh, republic? How shameful and how disgraceful. Who is going to speak? Who are going to address these issues? We have to train people who are educated, who are able and brave enough to speak. The Prophet ﷺ, before I conclude, the Prophet ﷺ, he would educate the young and he would give the young responsibilities. And this is another thing you can add into the list. He wouldn't treat the children like children. He would treat the children as young men and young women. He would empower them with responsibilities. Take the example of the great Osama bin Zayd. Usama bin Zayd was 17 years old. 17 years old when the Prophet ﷺ gave him leadership of the army. Go and fight the battle. One of the biggest armies was led by a 17 year old. And inside of his army was who? He had the likes of Abu Bakr, he had the likes of Umar. And the Prophet ﷺ hand picked Usama bin Zayd. How many 17 year olds can you give a huge responsibility like that today? Let alone 17 year olds, how many 30 year olds could you say that are men and they're grown up and they can handle their responsibilities? Reverend says, we need to step up. We need to do work. Our 17 year olds at that time were leading armies. Our 17 year olds of today are doing what? So I ask you and I plead to you. My question is, where are our Usama bin Zayd? Where are our, our Salahuddin al Ayyubis? And for our sisters as well, where are our sisters? Sisters like Khawla bint al Azwar. Likewise, many other great female uh, companions of the process and other great females who contributed greatly to our uh, civilization and our society. We need to step up and we need to do the work. Allahumma ja'alna min man istami'oona al-qawla fi yattabiyuna ahsana. Abbanatina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma la tada lana dhamman illa ghafartah. Wa la hamman illa farajtah. Wa la karban illa nafastah. Wa la mayitan illa rahimtah. Wa la maridan illa shafaytah. ولا دينا إلا قديته ولا غائبا إلا حفدته ولا مجاهدا في سبيل إلا نصرته ولا عدوا إلا أهلكته ولا طاغيا إلا قصمته اللهم إننا نعوذ بك من النفاق ونعوذ بك من الرياء ونعوذ بك من سوء الأخلاق اللهم إننا نعوذ بك من الهم والحزن ونعوذ بك من العجز والكسل ونعوذ بك من الجبن والبخل ونعوذ بك من غلبة الدين وقهر الرجال اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر إخواننا المستضعفين في دين في سائر الأوطان اللهم انصر المسلمين في فلسطين وفي غزة وفي السودان وفي باكستان وفي بنغلاديش وفي كل مكان اللهم اجعل آخر كلامنا من الدنيا لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن الله وملائكة يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما إن الله يأمر بالعاد والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنع أقيم الصلاة